Redemption Church family. So good to be together in the house of the Lord. Let's stand and worship our God together. Nothing can 
even when we're faithless, you are faithful, for you cannot deny yourself. Thank you for your mercies that are new every single morning. Great is your faithfulness, Jesus.
Well done, young man. My goodness. Do you, you sense the presence of the Lord in the room? Have mercy. If you have your Bible, we'll be in uh, Romans chapter, uh, chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Is there anyone in the room uh, this morning that just maybe has a special need for prayer? Just sensing that the spirit of the Lord's kind of hovering in the place. And, okay, up there, anyone else? Yes, sir. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Anyone else? Balcony. All right, back there. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Spirit of the Lord, call upon him. Neil answer. It's nothing too hard for him. Uh, I'd like us just to bow here for a minute. Those of you who've raised your hands, if you don't mind, while we're bowing our head, if you would just stand up where you are, if you can. That's just your acknowledgement, I have a need, and you're asking the Spirit of the Lord just to meet the need in your life, and I'm going to ask him to do that. Okay? All right, the rest of us, your responsibility is just to pray in the presence of the Lord in the house. He's able to touch each one of these, and he knows exactly what the need is. And in corporate prayer, we're going to ask God to do something that only he can do. But he's able to meet every need in the room. And we're going to ask him and believe him that he will. Because it's his invitation. It's not my invitation. It's his invitation. Occasionally, the Spirit of the Lord comes into a place for a season. And he wants to do something. And I just sensed that this morning. So let's join together in heart and let's pray. Father, this morning, these brothers and sisters have acknowledged a need in their life. You have prompted them by your spirit to acknowledge the need. And as they stand in our presence, they're asking you and believing and trusting you that as they open their heart to express this to you, they're acknowledging that the God of the universe is the one who is able to meet every need in the house. So Father, we know you're a good Father. Your mercy is abundant. Your loving kindness is without end. Your patience knows no boundary. And in the storehouse of heaven, there is a vast supply that will never run out to meet our needs. And so I'm asking you, Father, and we as a corporate church family are uniting our hearts in corporate prayer to ask you, would you sovereignly reach out and touch each of these and meet the need that's in their life. And Lord Jesus, you told your disciples, up until this point, you haven't asked anything in my name. And then you said to them, look, ask in my name and I will do it. And so this morning, Lord Jesus, we're taking you at your word. 
the spotless Lamb of God, the promise you made to us in your name, in your authority. We're asking your Father to do this work. In the authority and the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Is there anyone in the room you feel like you have a word from the Lord that he's prompted you to share with us? Say, how would I know, Brother Gordon? Well, your heart will be pounding. (laughs) Your hands will be sweating. (laughs) And you'll be trying to talk yourself out of it. Someone in the room? The Lord has a word you want to... I was in West Africa leading a meeting one time, and I had this great message. And uh, before I could get up to speak, the Holy Spirit just said, you just sit down and be quiet. (laughs) I have something else I want to talk about here. So I shared that with the group, and I sat down on the chair right in front of them. Got very quiet in the room. And then uh, a young lady got up and said something. She felt bad for me, you know. She wanted me to (laughs) look better. And so she got up and tried to bail me out. And the Holy Spirit just said, that's not what I want to say. So I said, thank you so much. I appreciate you sharing, but I feel like there's something else God is saying. So she sat down and got quiet again. Then there was a lady... You know, oh, there you go. Uh, You know, I can tell you this. I found our adversary, he's not afraid of a church. Uh, He walks into our church meetings without any intimidation. But what he likes to do is disrupt things. But fortunately, he has no power authority over us. And nothing he can do can thwart what the Holy Spirit wants to do except us. So uh, I I was quiet again, and then this lady stood up in the congregation, and she blurted out, tears streaming down her face, it's me, it's me. She came out from her seat and stood in the aisle. She called a name. Later I found out it was her husband. Like our media team, he was in the wings running the media. And I had seen him during the week. It just looked like he was a scared little chicken. (laughs) I mean, every time I'd see him, it's just like he wanted to dodge or hide or a little short little guy. His wife was rather powerful and strong looking to me. So she called his name. He came out from behind the wings of the platform. So little mousy man is standing in front of the whole congregation. And this lady begins to weep and cry and she says, I owe you an apology. They were in a tough assignment in West Africa out in the desert and she had been bitter and blamed him for her hardship. Because she said, you brought me out here (laughs) to this hard place. And she said, I haven't been the kind of wife I should be to you. I haven't supported you. I've been bitter against you. I've tried to thwart your calling. I've done everything I can to undermine you. And she said, but here in the presence of these colleagues, missionary friends, I want to ask you for your forgiveness. Mousy man jumped off the platform. (laughs) It was like the chariots of fire. (laughs) He goes bounding down the aisle. They embrace next to the pew where she had gotten out. 
weeping and tears. And we observed reconciliation. Now guess what the message was? Reconciliation. We had a perfect picture. So when I say to you, do you have a word from the Lord? God can speak through donkeys. <laughs> uh, I found that he takes the foolish things of the world and confound the wise. So is there anyone in the room after that preamble? Is there something the Lord's just impressing in your heart you feel like you need to say? Anybody? Yes. Yeah. Go ahead and stand up. Yeah. You can come up here if you'd like. I'll just carry this down there. Is that okay with your camera guys? All right. They'll find me. All right. What's on your mind? Um, our Sunday school lesson this morning keeps hitting and keeps hitting. I lead the college group. And... We're in John. We're starting John. And my drive in, I was thinking, in the beginning, that's the beginning of John 1. In Genesis, in the beginning. And I was thinking about the ability to trust in our Lord Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men and the light shineth in the darkness and the darkness comprehended it or overcame it not. The darkness was lesser than the light of the Lord. Then there was a man sent from God, his name was John, John the Baptist. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. So the Jews did not receive Jesus. But as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believeth on his name, which were born not of blood, not, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh. Now, I know we've heard this a lot. I've heard this for decades. But let it wash over you freshly, church. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. One thing to remember, the word became flesh. Jesus Christ, the incarnate word of God. Listen to what the word of God did in Genesis 1. And God said... Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. This is so Old Testament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven and the evening and the morning were the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together. Verse 14. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of heaven. Verse 20, and God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature. Verse 24, and God said, verse 26, and God said, let us make man in our image and our likeness. Whatever you have today, Jesus Christ that we can believe in is the creative power that made the universe come into being. Amen. Trust in that. That's it. Thank you, brother.
Amen. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Isn't it interesting that that's exactly in the text that we will cover today? The Spirit of the Lord, where He is, there's freedom. And in the presence of the Lord is joy. It's one of the greatest signs of the presence of God. I was speaking at a church uh, in Lynchburg. There was a student there who, after I spoke, came up to me and said, I want to talk with you. He said, I'm struggling with uh, the security of my salvation. I don't know if I've ever really been saved before. And I said, well, the fruit of the Spirit, one of the major signs is joy. And the young man said, that's exactly what I'm missing. I have no joy in my life. When the presence of the Lord is in a room, there's an overwhelming sense of who he is and who we are. And if I'm not right with him, there's no joy because I can't rejoice as the bride with the bridegroom when my lamp is out of oil. And so when I'm in the room where the presence of the Lord is, one of the responses is a sense of conviction because I realize how unlike him I am. But when I'm in right fellowship with him, then when the presence of the Lord is in the room, there is this sense of joy because he's confirming to us the reality of our faith and He's confirming to us that he is still firmly fixed in the heavens. He hasn't gone anywhere. Uh, History is running exactly on time and he knows exactly where we are. He knows exactly where you are. He knew exactly what the needs were in this room and he knew exactly who would be in the room this morning for this service. He knew exactly who would be watching online. Uh, He knew exactly who would be turning on their television, watching on television. Uh, He knows everything that's happening, every detail of every life. And sometimes he just likes to let us know (laughs) that he's in charge. Yes, sir. Fast heart, <laughs> and I'm shaking. So, anyway, and that's not my that's not my style usually. <laughs> Come here. Right. Uh, Gordon and I have sort of a, I, I guess, a funny relationship. We first met at the first meeting with uh, after Pastor Ben left here, and uh, I introduced myself to him, and he apparently knew who I was. So he looked me in the eye and he says, uh, "I have one question for you." He says, "How's your forgiveness doing?" And that sort of shocked me, and it's actually haunted me, okay, ever since, and I've shared that with Gordon a few times as he's preached, and, and uh, this morning when he started talking, you actually hadn't spoken but about 10 seconds, and I pretty much knew that you were talking to me. I felt like it, straight to me, and um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a, uh, I'm a guy that has trouble sometimes with forgiveness. And we've been through some rough times in the church. And I guess I decided, you know, who my enemies were and who my friends were and those types of things. And uh, it's really haunted me. And I really believe that God sent Gordon here to sort of get me straight, okay, the right man. And and I also think he's the right man for this church at this time to do that. So God has convicted me this morning that I need to make a change. I make change my direction and I need to start you know forgiving people and, and realizing that uh, the truth is is that a God in the heaven came down to earth as Christ and forgave me okay and that forgiveness really means that I don't have the right not to forgive other people and just to add 
injury to our Bible study this morning was on forgiveness. <laughs> okay. I want everybody. All right. So for those of you who are dealing with me, I forgive you. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> so, so, but, but you know, so here's the other question. Okay, so, so he forgives you. But, you know, the other side of that coin is do you forgive him? I mean, maybe you've been offended or hurt or something's been a wound in your life and our brother is feeling that weight of that in his soul today. So, you know, forgiveness offered has to be forgiveness received. So you said you forgive him, but do you accept his request for forgiveness? Those of you in the room? Amen. <laughs> Does this mean I get to stop shaking? No, no, you don't get to stop shaking. We'll move on to the next thing you need to work on, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know this, honestly, it has nothing to do with Gordon Ford. Uh, God's not impressed with anyone's titles. <laughs> and he's not impressed with our education or our resources. Uh, we're all children of the Most High God. One time I was asked to speak at a university uh, graduation service in Louisiana, and the president who was talking to me began to tell me who had been there before. He wanted to convince me of how important this was. He said, we've had a Supreme Court judge speak at our commencement service. Former President George W. Bush Sr. spoke at our uh, graduation service. And I told the president, I said, Mr. President, you know, I'll pray about this, but if I feel led to come, here's going to be your problem. I said, you've just listed the who's who. But when your audience, parents and family of your graduating seniors look at the program and see my name, they're going to say, who's he? <laughs> uh, the important thing for each one of us here and you look watching online, we don't want to forget that you're tuned in is, is that we are ambassadors of the most high God. Everyone in this room who's a child of God, you're his ambassador. And as his ambassador, you have to understand as I do every day, he's in charge. And he has a right to ask us to do anything. It may be humiliating for you, but never forget it's not about you and it's not about me. It's about him. And anytime he is in a place, he's not going to share his glory with anybody. He is preeminent. King of kings, Lord of lords, master of the universe. Our brother read the scripture. He spoke. He said the world came into existence. We are but grain of sand. And to be loved by God, the most incredible thing in the world. To be loved by him. Be offered forgiveness, salvation. And then to be adopted into his family. And to be called a child of God. And he's our heavenly father. Unbelievable. Romans chapter 10. There's a universal dilemma here. But there's also a universal declaration here before we get to the dilemma. Because in Romans chapter 10, Paul is laying out for the, us the scripture, verse 11, whoever believes on him shall not be embarrassed, shamed, for there is no difference between the Jew, the Greek, 
For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. And here's the universal declaration. For whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And if I was a Christian in the room, I'd say amen right there. (laughs) Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know why you ought to say amen? You're counting on that. Aren't you glad he didn't say whoever calls on the name of the Lord and is good, the rest of his life I'll save him. Aren't you glad he didn't say whoever calls on the name of the Lord and kind of works on getting their education, gets a master's or a a doctorate, you finally get really smart enough, then I'll save you. Aren't you glad he didn't say, hey, whoever calls on the name of the Lord, as long as you live on the right side of the tracks, then I'll save you. Or in the right country or the right political party, then I'll save you. Aren't you glad that he just made a universal declaration? Whoever calls on the name of the Lord, I will save you. I was out in island of Cuba. I've been there a couple of times. In Cuba, there's a Santeria cult. They wear white garb. I want you to see a picture of a guy who is a part of that cult. He was a high priest in the cult. You got that picture? Here he is. His wife also joined him. He was one of the priests in the cult. Here's a picture of he and his wife together. Before that, is there not another one before that? There. Deep in occultism, shackled by darkness. And something happened to him. He heard the gospel. And when he heard the gospel, he called on the name of the Lord to save him. Now I want you to see a picture of it. Do you have the next one of he and his wife? No. Nope. That's a different one. That one. Thank you. The same man. Do you see any difference in their countenance? What happened to him? He called on the name of the Lord. And the Lord saved him. Saved him out of occultism. Broke the shackles of his chains. Broke the power of sin in his life. And today, this gentleman is a pastor Baptist pastor of a church on the island of Cuba. Whoever calls from wherever you are, however deep you've gone, however however high the mountain of your sin, however broken you are, however far you feel you are from God, Whatever your past is, he's, he's, he's calling out to you and he's wooing you through his spirit and he's saying to you, call on me, I'll save you. I was in Rio de Janeiro. I was speaking to a Bible school there. And afterwards, the uh, He was the president of the Home Mission Board of Brazil. He had his phone and he said, Pastor, I want to show you something. Popped a picture onto his screen, showed me a picture and he said, it was of this girl who was uh, not there yet. (laughs) He's trying his best. (laughs) I I always chuckle about the media group. You know, if you don't see anything about what they're doing, it's a perfect Sunday. I was speaking in Florida, getting towards the time for invitation. Suddenly, no one was looking at me. Everyone was watching the overhead. And I looked over, and there was a solitaire game on the screen. (laughs) And I said, take that red seven, move it to that black eight. You got to (laughs) play. There was a young man who was a 
uh, college student, the normal guy wasn't there. And so he had volunteered. And uh, I mean, the pastor was so embarrassed, you know, but I said, ah, you know, <laughs> this is a minor detail to me. But uh, I said, the perfect day is when you don't know they're there. Okay. So this man showed me this picture and the picture was grotesque. I, I didn't ask him for a copy. It was so grotesque. You, you could barely make out it was a human being. It's skin and bone, tattered hair, dirty, unkempt, pockmarked arms from drug usage. Just a little tattered cotton dress. The person in the picture looked like she could have been 80 years old. He told me she was 23. They had found her in an area of Rio called Crackerville. She had been on the streets since she was about six or seven years old. When they found her, she was 23. And they rescued her. They took that little tattered body out to a farm that the Baptists of Brazil have. And out on the farm, began to nurture her back to health, give her good food, help her break her habit, get her off the drugs. And along the way, as she observed these people taking care of her, she's like, why are you doing this? And she heard the gospel. And Maria called on the name of the Lord to save her. She got married and she was in the Bible school where I was speaking. And afterwards, pastor said, you remember that picture I showed you on my phone? I want you to meet her. And then he, now then go to that picture. <laughs> That's Maria. You see any difference? Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, I'll save you. Uh, Leanne and my wife and I were with our daughter, Sarah, who was about four. And our son, Giles, who was two at that time, had had a viral infection that had gotten into his sinuses and had settled and was uh, forming a, a mass. And we had to medevac him from our village, my own Botswana, down to Johannesburg to get him to care. And we were sitting at a table. Giles was in critical condition. The doctor had said, if we cannot get an antibiotic that can counteract this, this infection will move back into his brain, form a mass, and potentially uh, take his life. We were sitting at this table. We were talking. Sarah had climbed on the table, I think, knocked sugar bowl over. <laughs> uh, Emily, you and Chad have something to really look forward to at two years of age uh, with Psalm. But I was trying to pull her down and there was a guy across the aisle from us in the restaurant and he started, he's by himself and he was started laughing watching Sarah's antics. And so I turned from our table and spoke to him across the you know, the little aisle there. And I said, well, it's easy for you to laugh. You're just sitting there by yourself. And he said, no, 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 don't be offended. He said, I'm just laughing because he said, I have a son about your daughter's age. And if he had been here with me, he'd be doing the same thing. And we struck up a conversation with Mike Davis and Mike said, um, I said, well, what are you doing here in Johannesburg? He said, well, I'm not from here. I'm from city of Durban. I'm here for an in Marine insurance underwriters conference. And then he said, you know, I've got great family. I'm a successful businessman. But he said, you know, I just feel like there's something missing in my life. And I said, well, Mike, let me just tell you the difference that Jesus Christ has made in our lives. And just shared a very simple testimony with him. And Mike said, that's, that's what I need. I said, well, would you like to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ today? By now, there's a, a waitress standing here listening to the conversation. And he said, here in the restaurant? I said, sure. So he leaned over towards our table and I leaned towards him in the aisle. 
and led him in a prayer as he put his faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Why could I make that decision there? Isn't that audacious to assure somebody that in a restaurant, (laughs) from wherever you are and whoever you are, a person can say, call on God and he'll save you? Isn't that a little crazy? But not when you know his word and know who he is. You know, the spotless lamb of God, he who knew no sin, he became sin for you and for me. Because there was only one way that God could save us. Somebody had to pay the penalty for my transgression and for yours. Today, if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, if you're watching on the stream or the television, if you're not a follower of Christ, then your sin, your rebellion, your disobedience has separated you from holy God. And God had to do something to remove that separation. Maybe you've tried doing good deeds, feeling like, well, if I'm just a good person, God will kind of show me some mercy. Unfortunately, you cannot do enough good to overcome the debt that you owe. God seeing you in that dilemma said, I had to find a way to be able to forgive you. The only way he could do that as a just, righteous judge was for somebody to pay the price of your sin. And so, an acceptable sacrifice had to be made. It had to be a lamb without spot or blemish. That was Jesus Christ. And when he died on the cross, God poured out his wrath on him for your sin and for mine. And Jesus drank the wrath of the cup of God's judgment. And finally, when he was done, he said, it's finished. And so brothers and sisters in the room today, that's why you can rejoice and be glad that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life because it doesn't take anything for you to earn it. Oh, it it takes a lot to obey, right? But we don't obey in order to be forgiven. Uh, We obey because we are forgiven. And we want to walk with our Father. Well, it's been amazing in the years to see people set free from the shackles of their sin. I was driving down the road with Leanne and our kids. There was a police roadblock in Botswana. And uh, this policeman walked over and I had a baseball cap that said, Jesu Kemurena, meaning Jesus is Lord. And he looked at my baseball cap. He asked me for my driver's license. And as he turned to walk away, he said in the Setswana language, "Ah, Satan was a black guy. Jesus was a white guy. And all us black folks are going to hell. And I called out to him. I said, sir, that's not correct. And he was startled because he didn't realize I understood what he had said. (laughs) So he turned around to come back and we were conversing in Setswana. I said, my brother, I said, the Bible says that Satan comes as an angel of light. I said, what color is light? He said, white. I said, you see? (laughs) I said, in fact, Jesus wasn't a white man and Jesus wasn't a black man. I said, Jesus was a brown man. I said, he was hachare. He was between us. I had some bad news for the country church I pastored in Texas who had that beautiful scene of the Jordan River, the blonde, sparkly, blue-eyed Jesus up there in the Jordan waters. (laughs) I don't don't think so. (laughs) 
I know many of you have been to Israel, and you know that uh, that's probably not right. He's probably tan, brown skin, dark jet black hair. And I said, you know what? But here's the thing. I said, you know what this man did who was between us? He died on the cross, and he shed his blood. What color do you think his blood was? He said, red. And I said to this policeman, you see, this Jesus died on the cross shed his red blood so that he could bring you as an African and me as a white man from America and he could forgive both of us. He looked at me intently and he said, I want to join your church. (laughs) So I had a little fun with him. I said, you can't join my church. Now he was offended. What do you mean I can't join your church? I said, To get into our church, you got to be born into our church. And he was puzzled. How can I be born into a church? I said, this is a spiritual birth. But today, if you had to repent of your sins, and in that African culture, repentance is a huge concept. It means you own responsibility for your transgression. I said, today, if you would own responsibility, repent of your sin, and put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you can be born into this church. He said, here on this road? I said, yes. So that policeman put his head inside my truck window. And what did he do? Called on the name of the Lord. And what does this word say? I'll save you. And what happened in the throne room of heaven in the presence of the angels? Party time. (laughs) That which was lost has been found. That which dwelt in darkness is in the light. That whose name was bound for eternity in hell has his name written in the Lamb's book of life. And one day, we'll join the angelic chorus. Praise be to God. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord, he said, I'll save you. I wish I could just leave it right there, but I would be remiss if I didn't conclude with the universal dilemma is there's this universal declaration, whoever calls. That solves the problem, right? Anyone who's lost in the world, if they call on Jesus, he'll save them, right? That's right, it's not a trick question. Whoever calls on him, he'll save them. So what's the problem? Those next verses haunt us. How can you call on someone to save you? if you don't believe in them. Paul has tricked us here in this text. He set us up. He's made this universal declaration, which boy, my heart soars up to the throne room of heaven with rejoicing and praise in this gift that Jesus gave to us in salvation, but then Paul lays a dilemma right behind it because he says, that's exactly right, but how do you call on someone to save you if you don't believe in them? And he sets up a Greek uh, philosophical argument with a conclusion. How do you call on someone to save you if you don't believe in them? But how do you believe in somebody that you've never heard of? How'd you answer that? I'd say you can't. How can you call on him to save you if you don't believe in him? But how are you going to believe in him if you've never heard of him? And then Paul says, how will you hear without a preacher? Not like this being a preacher. It was the word kerusa, which meant one who is a trumpeter. It came from the Greek arena when the athletes were getting ready for the Olympic Games to go marching in to compete. There was a balcony of trumpeters. 
the person in charge of the games would say, uh, he'd look at him and nod and they would blow their trumpets. They would Russo, meaning time for the games to begin. And when the athletes heard that sound, they would go marching in. That's this word. He was saying, how can they hear unless somebody blows the trumpet, explains it to them, helps them understand it. And then he says, how will anyone ever preach unless what? Unless somebody sends them. This last week, the International Mission Board trustees just approved 83 new missionaries who will go and represent our churches across the nations of the world because we're convicted that we owe our witness. We have a treasure. It's in your earthen vessel. We don't just come in here to church to please ourselves. We come here to rejoice, to be rejuvenated, to be refreshed in the presence of the Lord, to worship Him. But not so that we can uh, relax and, and say, that was good for me, go home, see you next week. No, no, no. <laughs> this is so that we can be equipped and encouraged for the battle that's outside the doors of our church. This week, wherever you are, you're asking God, Spirit of God, where does this message need to be delivered today? Who needs to hear this message today? Lord, send me to somebody who's waiting in darkness, like Mike Davis in Johannesburg, like the policeman on the road in Botswana, and countless other places in the world, like the Santeria pr priest who was waiting out on the island of Cuba for someone to come and say, you don't have to live like this anymore. God has opened a door so that you can be saved. God wants to save everybody. But brothers and sisters, the invitation is in your pocket. It's in my pocket. I've got their invitation right there. Can you imagine being lost and nobody's looking for you? Oh, let's be about our Father's business. Let's rejoice in our good salvation that our name is written. Today we can have peace with Him. And today if there's a distance between you and God, there's a sense of separation from Him because there's stuff in your life that you know that you haven't dealt with. Uh, Brother Slater dealt with some this morning. It's heavy in his heart. But I can tell you this, when he walks out the door today, when it comes to that matter, <laughs> you can have a lighter step. Sleep a little better tonight. How about you? Stuff in your life? Things that have gotten in the channel between you and your fellowship with holy God today that God would through his spirit put his hand on it and say I need to deal with this right here there's nothing worth living without the joy of the Lord it's a huge difference to walk in the flesh using your own willpower to carry out your Christian life or to walk in the fullness of the Spirit with the joy of the Lord flowing out of your life until He calls you home. Is there anything He would touch in your life today? Then He says, if you confess your sins, I'm faithful and just to forgive you, to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Some things are between you and God alone. There may be a few things that you have to make a phone call or make a visit to deal with to put it right so that there's no unfinished business in your life. But brothers and sisters, no one can separate us from the love of Christ. Oh, thanks be to God for that. Let's pray together.
praise team is going to lead us just in a response. We're not going to prolong this time. But as you're praying right there in your pew where you are, there's something you want to deal with the Lord about. This altar is open here at the front. If you'd like to just come down here and pray. Some of our brother deacons will be here at the front. If you'd like to talk with one of them and ask them to pray for you, you feel the freedom to do that. We're just going to stay seated as the praise team is leading. You're bowed in prayer. You just talk to God. The spirit of the Lord is really near today. His presence is all over the room. It's calling, speaking, he's wooing, he's encouraging, he's exhorting, he's convicting. Whatever he's doing in your heart, your responsibility is just to trust him and obey him. So, something you need to come down here and lay before the Lord at the altar, you feel the freedom, just stand up and come on down. If there's people on either side of you, they'll be happy to get out of your way. If you're up in the balcony, it's time for you to get down the stairway, make your way here. Don't let any excuse halt you from doing what God's impressing in your heart, okay? The rest of us, as they're singing, you just remain in a spirit of prayer, and I'll close this in just a minute, okay? Thank you, praise team. Lord, we thank you today. Our hearts are full from just being in your presence and the freedom to worship you. Thank you for what you've done in our midst today. And Lord, as we go through this day, through the remainder of this week, would you just keep your hand firmly on each one of us? And would you bless each one in the room with your mercy, your love and your kindness. May you bless us out of the storehouse of heaven because we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Just briefly, we have some announcements that are going to be given. After that, two weeks ago, we asked to have a call business meeting. It's going to be a very brief business meeting. Matt Cobb will be coming up to, to take us through this vote of affirmation to approve the decision that your board made to affirm Brian Autry as our acting senior pastor. Uh, our deacons, Brother Mike, uh, polled them and unanimously they uh, agree with that motion and our board does. 
but Matt will lead us through that time. So you come and give us the announcements. Matt will lead us through that time, and then we'll be concluded. Thank you. Good morning, Grove family. Good to see everyone. And a special welcome to our visitors. If you're a first-time visitor, we have a special gift gift for you back in the atrium. So if you'll come and uh, meet us there at the welcome desk, we would love to get to know you. Um, today is our VBS lunch and training um, right after the service. If you have not signed up yet, feel free to come on. We have a spot for you. Um, if you can't serve the week of VBS, June 23rd to 27th, we are actually going to be decorating the two weeks prior. So if you can help us there, Please come. We would love um, to have as many as we can to serve these children. Um, Youth Emphasis Sunday is June 9th. Um, it's going to be a special time to celebrate with our 2024 graduates and just the youth group in general. So come support them, see what the Lord's doing in their lives. Um, also June 9th, we are going to be having a women's book club launch. There will be more details to follow, but um, just keep that on your radar. Um, if you are looking to get involved serving in the church body, stop by and see Mike Mintz or one of his deacons. They will be out there so that we can um, get you plugged in and served. And the last thing I believe, next Sunday, there is no kids or preschool. We are gonna be here, family service. Um, so just keep that in mind as well. And I think that will do it.